Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. So, welcome back to another show of um, Access to Perspectives Conversations. And our esteemed guest today is Monica gonzalez Marquez, who is a dear friend and colleague of mine from a couple of years ago and every now and then again. Um, Monica, yeah, warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It's so really glad. nice to be here. So glad to catch up again and again and now um, with witnesses and listeners uh, <laughs> alongside. And um, so we've we've worked together um, mostly through our um, sh- you know, Laid and common French on tenant is I think also how we met in the first place. Um, we also spent time together in Paris um, at the actually have a poster here, wasn't it around the open science um, world? Science yeah, it was a UN Paris. meeting, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah, <laughs> so we um, had some time to actually check in, get to know each other a little bit closer beyond um, the, the work related stuff. We are both advocates for open science since, should I say the early days? It like, sounds so old, makes us so old, but maybe we are. We are old, old, Joe, yes, since the um, early days. <laughs> <laughs> the early days of our kind of, like where, before it became such a political thing as we find it to be today, political yes. and economically. Yes. Um, yes. So we're talking about 2015, 2016, where um, I think it had its peaks on the, um, bottom-up approach before then the major stakeholders um, I mean the institutional stakeholders adopted open science into their frameworks and agendas which is both challenging and a great opportunity and allows us to actually now further professionalize or what we've already done our commitment and now we can advocate and and help implement open science practices further but um, let's hear from you. <laughs> and um, again, thanks for, for joining us today. Let's start perhaps with a little bit of personal background. What, um, what is your kind of career steps that led you to your current position? I don't think I've mentioned that. So you're now working at Ulich Institute in Germany, Aachen? Uh, yeah, Ulich Fortune Centrum Ulich. <laughs> trying to uh, get the order in English, like... actually German. Yes, and I work there as the open science manager. And Ulig is mostly into physics and and space research, or I oh, know it's it's a broad of... range of um, sciences, physical sciences. Yeah. There, there's actually some neuroscience as well. Yeah, it's just oh. a broad range of science institutes. It's massive. Yeah, it's absolutely massive. And what I think people who know about it, it amazes me that lots of people don't know about Ulich. But one of the things that people do know about it is that um, there is a nuclear waste dump there. So getting onto the grounds is an adventure because you need security to get in. You need to be cleared and you need to be invited. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, what's really funny about that is that there are some people who are part of Ulich who behave as if the work they're doing is so special that that's why we need security to get on the grounds. And it's like, no, it's because there's nuclear waste. <laughs> it has nothing to do with with the, with the your research at all. I mean, no, it's you're just a public research institute. That's it. Yeah. Wow. Is that scaring you? So no, 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 not at all. It's not, not in all. the health threatening. There, there is so much infrastructure in place okay. in case there was any kind of a leak. And no, no, it's 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 okay. completely fine. Though it must be said that the reason that um, the site for the nuclear waste was built there was specifically because it was in the middle of nowhere. And it is a little sobering to consider that they still thought 
that the researchers would be, you know, expendable at least in case that <laughs> in case there was an accident. Well. <laughs> it's like we're not going to kill that many people, but we're going to kill these researchers. Hmm. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's just you know just thinking about it. It's like okay, so it was built in the middle of nowhere specifically so that um, no large uh, population center would would be hurt in the event of an accident but they stuck a bunch of researchers there <laughs> yeah or maybe we're thinking those researchers know how to take care of themselves let's hope that uh, they're they're rich. Rich. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> okay Thanks. let's leave, let's leave that that comment unanswered mm -hmm. yeah um but as to my background let me see um i began in uh linguistics philosophy of science oh um, for us to talk about that also maybe in another um, session because okay interesting like philosophy of science is still part of your game of your of your work now with Helio, which we will come oh to. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah so i mean I, i the work that i'm doing now i think is um the result of the different ways that i've considered the human experience and science So I started there and then I went, um, I eventually ended up at Cornell with two BAs, one in linguistics and the other, or actually French studies focus on linguistics and uh, the other one in cognitive science. Um, I was wanting in the States, right? Yeah, that's, I was in the States. Yeah, 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 yeah. I grew up in California. Yeah, I'm, I'm Chicana, Mexican-American, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. um, Latine, I think is the the latest term. Um, yeah, identify with. I think it's important. And I, I think I identify with human. That's that's broad and good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm human. Last I checked. Um, but at Cornell, I came. Up, I, I was presumably being trained, but the the policy there was pretty much a sink or swim, and the training was scarce. Hmm. Uh, I came in thinking that I was going to be trained and I really wasn't. I was left to figure things out on my own. Um, and I didn't do a very good job of that because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I had a theoretical background in science, but as everyone knows, there is the Grand Canyon of difference between what's theoretical and what's applied or what's actually implemented. Hmm. So um, because of that, I started a workshop series, uh, Methods in Cognitive Linguistics, um, for which I put out my first book, um, which is a collection of writings on methods. Uh, it's an edited volume called Methods in Cognitive Linguistics, um, for which, amazingly, I still get uh, royalties, even though it was published, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. Nice. For an academic book, that is a big deal. <laughs> Let's make sure, yeah. like, I remind you afterwards, but also whoever is listening now and wants to read that book, you find the link to it or... And I'll look at the yeah, yeah, I'll 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 it. definitely provide the link to it. Yeah, yeah. Any other um, resources we come to mention as well? So check. yeah, I mean, it's you can actually download the um, unedited proofs on my ResearchGate page. Okay, it's just there. Just download the whole thing for we'll free. Make sure to link that Taxpayers over. paid for it. The okay. yeah, the NSF paid paid the subvention. So yeah, just download it. Don't buy it. Download it. It's all there. Yeah, but in the middle of all of that, um, I started to realize that there were big issues in our training. And then for better or worse, um, someone, yes, Daniel Lackens introduced me to the open science movement. Um, so I guess I should thank him for that. Um, I think you should anyway. come across it sooner or later anyways, because it's just only present. But probably, earlier... I probably would have. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, I give credit where it's due, hmm. despite other issues. Um, in any case, uh, I then plunged right in. And around that time, I started to do I was starting to do research on how to read scientific literature. Mm -hmm. um, because once again, it, it's one of those things that we're not taught how to do. We're just kind of expected to know how to do by osmosis. Hmm. Um And out of the work on, on reading science, on science reading, um, I scraped together money, which still hasn't been very much, because what I keep getting from the different funding bodies is that we don't need to fund this because the professors teach their students how to read papers. And it's like, no, they don't. 
clients. I have so much survey data showing mm -hmm. that no one teaches people really how to read scientific papers. It's a skill that some that people some somehow pick up mm. most of the time, not very well. Mm. And uh, we see the evidence of that, of course, and how badly papers are cited, um, because some of that, yes, is people just looking up whatever is relevant or being told what to cite. Mm. But a not insignificant proportion is people not understanding how to interpret scientific literature, how to read things carefully and um therefore not knowing how to reference the material that's contained in papers. I mean, mm -hmm. that of course is just one issue. There's many, many, many more issues around that. But that's that's how I started. I started developing methods. And um, the methodology that we've developed is around the idea that uh, science is a narrative. It's, it's, it's problem solving. It is a problem solving narrative. It is a goal directed narrative. I, and it's not even a very complicated one. It's very run-of-the-mill garden variety. You have a goal and you decide that you're going to accomplish your goal by doing X, Y, and Z. So you test X, Y, and Z and you see what works and um, or doesn't work. And then you assess your results and then um, you decide whether you're done or whether you have more questions that you need to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so we developed methodology that pretty much takes that perspective, that hmm. science is narratives. And in the methodology, we help people become aware of how narrative is a basic information organizing mechanism in their minds, how they use it every day at every level. Hmm. Um, and then once we get, then one, once that's established, then we give them a paper to read and suddenly comprehension goes through the roof. And I'll also give you the, the link to our paper showing all of that preliminary data. Um, we were amazed at how quickly um, people's comprehension increased and how dramatically it increased. Though we think, and this is still a hypothesis that we're pursuing, is that it's because science is inherently narrative and we're not really teaching people how to do something new. We're yeah. simply helping them redirect their attention to science um, in the same way so that they can understand it in the same way that they would understand anything else from a novel to gossip to a newspaper article. It's like th that mechanism, use it. And anything that doesn't make sense, ask questions. Well, I, I yeah. just had an, you know, the name of my brand is Access to Perspectives. I just had a moment of that mm -hmm. again. So this is how I love these conversations because I learned so much myself and I just hope that other people are listening can follow through and also have their lightning bulb moments. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I I love the, the way because I, I tend to remind researchers early career, especially about any particularly, um, or really, uh, is like, remember the why are we doing this in the first place? And not just mm -hmm. uh, referring back to the resource question, but what's the bigger picture? And what, why did I choose this career to begin with? What's motivating me to pursue that research question? And now you adding, yes, research is a narrative. I also tell people since a couple of years now, thanks to my learnings and th thanks to my learnings, shouldn't um, kind of skip words in a sentence. Thanks to the learnings I had through open science, but also as a researcher, that not the actual article is just a narrative. Like you said, it's a narrative, like it's a written story, contextualizing the data that um, a researcher or research team has um, brought about or has kind of put together um, through their investigations of whatever nature. And then, so storytelling is also what, what kind of drives societies and how we adapt to our environments. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's it's so important to every now and then have this kind of bird's eye, bird's view perspective on what's happening through and with research. Yeah, 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 I mean, this reality check. Though, I mean, since you do mention storytelling, I do need to clarify that there are two kinds of narratives going on in science. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the narrative that I call MSU, um, which stands for making shit up. And 
uh -huh. also refers to hypothesizing after results are known. That is not what we're talking about. But that's a mad so, practice, right? That's like it's, it's data yes, it and is. the story around it. It's a questionable research practice. Yes, that's mm -hmm. when people make up a story after they have the results. What I'm talking about here, what my team is talking about, is the fact that scientific processes are inherently narrative. Yeah, no, that's what I also meant. Yeah, that's so that's really, really different because I've been attacked by people. I mean, I remember a specific conversation at University College London where um, this professor, this full professor, proceeded to shit on my work saying that I was suggesting, no, I'm not, not suggesting, that I was proposing that people should just tell fairy tales about their work. And of course, I called her on it. And it's like, that that's not what I said at all. And by the way, you're a psychologist. And you're a woman, and a white woman, and I'm a woman of color. So how, how, how could you do this? I mean, how could you treat me so badly? And then on top of that, because you weren't listening. But anyway, um, the bottom line is that what we're talking about here is cognitive narrative. It's mm -hmm. narrative as a basic information structuring mechanism in human cognition. And to make the point that the scientific method looks the way it does because it's a product of a narrative mind. Of course. Yeah, it's so important to remember because researchers often pride themselves in saying, oh, it's so neutral, it's so kind of um, technical. We, we abstract it to a sense that it's kind of a neutral information we convey is always biased just there, there's science no is produced it. by humans it is inherently yeah. sub subjective yeah. and biased and, the, and it, anything else is, that, that is the real, only real fairy tale that that we can yeah. have objectivity and science that is a fairy tale we can attempt and that's like also what is was what is expected of of researchers to attempt to to stay neutral as much as possible, but we're still humans in a certain societal context, political context, whatnot's going on in the world currently. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's really important that we stop confounding objectivity with rationality. We are rational beings. We are capable of taking arguments and building points based on these arguments. This is rationality. Exactly. But that is and not that objectivity. Sense? There is no such thing as objectivity, right? No, of course you can, not. You can attempt it, but you'll never reach it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. It's it's a becoming process. So it's in that sense, it's very very Heideggerian. It's a becoming process, but I mean, we we, we can't. I, we I can't. want to ask it's you in to the nature of the questions every... we ask and. You, you yeah. just mentioned terms from psychology or whatever philosophy was coming from. So I'm not going to ask you on each one every. What's Heideggerian? Heideggerian. Heidegger. Heidegger. Yes, 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 yes. She famously would talk about a bloomen or flowers. How flowers flower. They're constantly in the in in the, in the state oh. of flowering, of being flowers. But then they decay at some point. Flowers always <laughs> like there's no such thing as an ever flowering flower. No, no, it's not about ever flowering. It's about being a flower as a verb. You're in that state of being, of becoming. Yeah, okay, that's too much philosophy for me. For yeah, it's okay. We don't have to go there. It's fine. The <laughs> but point I, I love the that... thought experiment, but it's really stretches my brain. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, the point The point is that, yes, we, we can definitely aim for some version of objectivity, but we need to understand that we're not going to get there because the tool set that we have is rationality. Yeah. All right. And, and it's, rationality it's actually, is, yeah. Rationality is always personal because it's informed by our experiences. Exactly. Okay. Our arguments are formed by our experience and by our knowledge, our very limited knowledge of the world. Mm. Which of course goes into a whole bunch of other issue, and then that's the, the, how how afraid so many researchers are of being uh, qualified as ignorant. And it's like, no, if you're going to be a good scientist, you're you need to become extremely comfortable with your ignorance because ignorance is what drives science. Ignorance is not your enemy. Ignorance is but your best ignorance, friend. Hmm? Ignorance consciously ignoring other people's. Accomplishments. No, that that that's something else. That is something else. Huh. Yeah. That is that is something else. Yes, yes. That what is that term? Uh, I've completely forgotten it. Um, um, um. 
I was so there's learned helplessness and then there's the other one. There there's um it's when you choose to be ignorant, but that's different. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Then, I mean children are but, ignorant of the world and that's okay. That's the level that's the kind of ignorance that I'm talking about. Ignorance not coming knowing. from cognoscere and not yet knowing or not ever knowing certain things. Yeah, so ignorance simply to... meaning you don't know. Yes. Okay, now that's yes. a good thing then. So it goes yes. back to the to the phrase or the quote, was it Aristotle or um Socrates? And the more I know, the more I know what I don't know. Exactly. That? It's yeah. it, it's exactly that. Yeah. So um last night I was explaining the scientific method to my kid. And I was explaining to him that the most difficult part of doing science isn't really the doing the the, the experiments or whatever. It's learning to ask a good question hmm. because asking a good question means understanding the phenomena and the limits of what you know about it, which is tremendously difficult to do, hmm. to understand the limits of your knowledge so that you can then turn those boundaries and, and, and shape them into a question that you can ask that will be productive, given the tools at your disposal. I mean, is it that, takes researchers a lifetime to learn to do that well. And is it also inclusive of, as you ask a question, assuming and expecting that that one question will trigger a whole cascade of more questions down the line? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how research kind of branches out and diversifies and whatnot. Yep. yep. Which is why it frustrates me that in so many countries, PhD students are typically given their questions and then told to go and do the work. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, when are they going to learn to ask questions? Because then, that is actually where the science is, learning to ask a good question. That's another thought I had the other day. I, I'm not sure I've actually voiced that in a conversation yet, but today we have way too many people who finish a high school degree like you know mm -hmm. to, to get um, access to university then way too many people at universities way too many universities to begin with as in like for those to actually produce knowledge as researchers to ask those questions because the majority of researchers and I would easily put myself in that category we just being pushed through the education system to either earn a good salary with a PhD, wherever we find ourselves in, or because our parents want us to be highly educated, whatever that means. And then it happens just what you just mentioned, that the research questions are being presented to us, which is execute. So just basically expensive or still as PhDs and still cheap labor without actually having to use our brain and asking those philosophical questions on science, even if it's natural yep. science we're talking about. Yep, yep, yep. Though I, I will take um, issue with your your point about there being too many universities. I, I don't think there are too many universities. Well, maybe not. Yeah, I just lumped that in. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no, but I, I think that, that what you're trying to get at is that we do not have enough staff to train the students moving through the universities to train them well. At we the other, at the other yeah. hand, we painfully in all countries around the world, we painfully lack blue color job fillings, like people who would take on blue color jobs, as in uh, carpenters, just for example, one example, like handicraft people, like because the majority aims for a university degree, which then brings you into a white color job. And then nobody's doing the work anymore. Like the farming um, has first just yes, been industrialized, but then anyway, so it's gone forever. <laughs> yeah. Come back to the to the actual topic and why we decided to have this conversation. We can certainly continue on other aspects of yeah, yeah, touched upon until now. But 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 before we 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 change uh, subjects, I I do want to underline that. Yes. So my family worked the worked the land and. Hmm. it's it's extremely highly skilled work it is i don't want to say the opposite i just yeah uh, it's, it's very very highly yeah, skilled yeah. work it is hard work and it deserves all of our respect absolutely it's why we all eat. <laughs> yeah no thanks for highlighting that i i had no intention and in kind of valuing one over the other but just mentioning we have too many people aiming for university degrees and uh presumably more respected jobs um in the economies but we need people who actually 
also like the handicraft uh, jobs were used to be arts. Now we're buying IKEA furniture yeah. of low quality, therefore also destructing our environments, cutting down forests, like natural forests. Yeah, the growing disposable society. Goods. Yeah, yeah. Let's not get started. So, anyways, I think no points. Yeah, yeah. All kinds of labor deserves respect. Because yeah, we need also it to make our societies function. Investments and also in time and money to so that that it can actually be <clears throat> respectful and respected again as a craft. Yep. What it used to be. Yep, I completely agree. Cool. Okay, but what you want to hear about is helio. Helio. So yeah, if you could just take us from okay, uh for your backgrounds. Um you can also shorten this however you want to frame it, but um, looking back at your career steps or the steps that led you to develop the heliocentered open science model, which is the topic yes. of the day. Yes. Okay. So um, the model came about from considering how difficult it was uh, to understand exactly what open science was trying to accomplish. Um, there are many, many statements and declarations, and they all have very lofty goals and ideals, um, but there really isn't anything that describes clearly, easily, what on earth it is we are trying to do. So um, I woke up in the middle of the night. Uh, this was probably a month or two after John died. And of course, I was thinking about a lot of the conversations that we'd had. I'd read write his papers. And I was also thinking about human cognition and how we think and how we organize information. And then in the middle of the night, I just I woke up and I suddenly saw this picture in my head. And what I saw was um, two planetary systems. Yeah. One that we were moving away from and one that we were moving towards. So what were these planetary systems? What I was seeing is that we were reproducing what had happened with the geocentric model of planetary motion and moving to the heliocentric model of planetary motion. So what exactly was going on here? We were trying to escape a model where we had positioned the scientific paper at the center of the science that we did. Yeah. Everything was about creating and serving the scientific paper because the scientific paper um, allowed for career mobility, allowed for so many things that supported, well, researchers' careers. And we'd also put it in a place where it was actors that were external to the science that governed it. So it meant that publishers and the constraints of publishing were dictating, were being put in a position where they could decide what the outputs of science could look like. So that meant that whatever constraints belonged to the paper became the constraints of documenting science. Mm -hmm. So anything that couldn't be captured on the two-dimensionality of the paper was pretty much left out, right. didn't become part of the scientific record. Um, so I know that there have been a lot of conversations about publishers owning our science. And yes, that's that's a really important thing and it's extremely problematic. But what Helio draws attention to is that they not only owned it, but constrained how it could be documented. But when so you said that we are referring to commercial, like yes. and also just the like a handful of commercial just, publishers. Just publishing, the publishing industry in general, pretty much the constraints of disseminating scientific information on paper, where every single word costs money. So that meant that papers were limited in how long they could be, and any information that couldn't be easily captured two-dimensionally was left out. Can I just hold you there for a second? And yeah. please keep the thought of where you're going next. But I want to intervene because the, the scientific journal, as sometimes being referenced, was established in 1665 at um, the Royal, whatever, UK Royal Society, mm -hmm. London. Yeah. Um, and then also shortly after the same year in, in Paris and France. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the intention, if I'm not misunderstood, but I read the introductory editorial to that first journal by o Odenberg, what's his name? Anyways, we'll reference that as well, um, where the intention was to allow for peer exchange and to have a yep. venue for researchers mm -hmm. to pub like to, to, to provide their accomplishments for discussion quality mm -hmm. assessment by the peers mm -hmm. uh, like not necessarily to share with the wider societies but at least to have yeah. like conversations about what's being researched but that's not where you're touching and where, is this where the problem started or is that only in the research? no no um yes and no mm. so this is in many ways a constraint of the the available technology the technology at the time was such that if you wanted to disseminate information, your technology was a paper or a, a journal or a book. Yeah. That is what you had. Mm -hmm. um, and to clarify, also papers at that time, because they really were intended to communicate the science to peers, mm -hmm. it contained they contained so much more detail than they do now. Sure. And this there is, this is a really, are. really important point to make. Yeah. So if you read papers from that era, they were much more detailed. Mm -hmm. They contained lots more information than they do now. Which we're and asking also, for again today through open science, but that's where yeah. I think towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that the reason that papers, at first uh, papers were, were not papers as we know them, they were letters. And then that format was set aside because um, researchers realized that we needed something that better described science as a process and that we needed to standardize that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that got lost um, was the generalized understanding that scientists wanted to document processes. They understood that they were documenting the narrative. Mm -hmm. this, this was understood. Mm -hmm. This is why the scientific paper today has the sections that it has. Mm -hmm. If you look at them, you realize that you're you're following the trajectory of a scientific process. This is on purpose. Yeah. So there was an understanding that this is what they were doing. So the structure was specifically about standardizing the steps of the scientific process as a process, not to focus on its outputs, but on the process. Mm -hmm. So this is why it looked the way it did. But then, of course, when publishers came in and money making came in, mm -hmm. things changed and then of course as papers became the currency of career advancement papers started to be published more and more no sorry papers started to be written more and more to be published not for the science they contain to be used mm. this is one of the reasons why right. the science that's described is incomplete mm. you can't there isn't enough information in papers for people to be actually be able to reproduce or if we don't want even want to go to reproduction to accurately peer review, to understand exactly what people did. Uh -huh. So, but, but we're still working within the constraints of the paper. So there were mistakes that were made by researchers. One of them being allowing the paper to become the currency of career advancement. Mm -hmm. And since this was still maintained within the hands of publishers, that meant that everything that could be monetized was monetized. And that meant that every single word counted which meant that descriptions were not allowed to be very long because they cost money. Mm. But of course... Well, they costed money. They used to cost money in the print era, but not so much anymore in the digital era. Yes, but and that's, 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 that's one of the fallacies that, that continue. I mean, I've come across journals that publish online that still charge for color images. I mean, it's it's the absurdity, but but this is this is exactly how the publishing industry continues to constrain how scientific now what scientific information can be disseminated. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, with the advent of the internet, um, we we were able to have something like open science. So understanding, in coming to understand the weaknesses in the dissemination that we were seeing. Mm. This is what allowed uh, I would allow the open science movement to happen. So what happens then? So we've got this, what we, which we call the geocentric model of, of scientific documentation that is entirely focused on the paper. Anything that fits the constraints of the paper and publishers is, is contained yeah. and everything else is left out. 
But then what are we moving towards with open science? And what we're moving towards is a model of scientific documentation and dissemination where it's not publishers that dictate how we document our science or what elements our scientific documentation should contain, but it's actually the scientific research question that decides that. So the type of question you ask dictates what your documentation should look like. And I'll go on into that in, in, in just a minute. So what that means, but of course the scientific question doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's constrained by resources. So if you imagine the scientific question as a little globe, imagine a shell around that globe and that shell is resources. If you do not have the resources you need to ask a question, your question is not going to be asked. It's yeah. that simple. Mm -hmm. Just quickly. Um, yeah. just for those of us who also like me in the first place are not as um, firm with astrophysics, <laughs> uh, when you say geocentered and heliocentered, um, so what you're now explaining to us is a, actually already, okay, so geocentric is assuming what you said earlier, that the research article is basically the earth. And and then how people like societies or some researchers would claim all oh, the earth is the center of everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's actually a misconception. And what you're exactly. arguing now for the heliocentric, where helio is the sun, and exactly. you're saying that the sun is represented in our open science approach by the research question. By the research question, by the resources that are necessary to address the research question That's and it. by the communicative drive. So there are three layers, right. the research question at the center, resources, and then the communicative drive. Because okay. science that is not, uh -huh, hold on a second, because science that is not communicated does not exist. Go on. For that, I just wanted to um, add that you have a poster, which is also accessible. On the yes. Show. yes, yes, I will. I will. Yeah. I will definitely um, pass along two versions of the poster, one that shows just the poster by itself and the other one that is annotated and explains um, these points. Um, so you position this three layered um, sun at the center and what are the what are the planets or what are the satellites around it? The, the satellites are the outputs. So um, as you decide, as you figure out what your research question is, that process of deciding what your research question is, that is one satellite of documentation. Mm -hmm. And that documentation or that process that you will describe, your arguments for why this is a, re a good research question, that will take the form of text because this is how it works. I mean, you're describing something. Mm -hmm. But if you go on to the method satellite, how are you actually addressing this question? That satellite won't be comprised only of text outputs. Hmm. That might have, um, I don't know, uh, a link to a video that shows uh, how the experiment is being conducted along with the written description. It might also go to a list of equipment that you need. Sure. So you can go and, and acquire the equipment if you want to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So the different, the different steps of the process will each have um, its own very, very, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to look, look, find here? Um, it will have... Uh, documentation elements that are very much about that step in the process. Sure. Furthermore, because a scientific process for physics is different than a scientific process for psychology, that means that the outputs will be different. Mm -hmm. For physics, you don't need a satellite on human subjects because you're not dealing with human subjects. So that satellite will not exist, but will we'll underline Every single scientific process is, of course, the scientific method. The scientific method, not in terms of the many different instantiations and theories and the, does it exist or not, but a scientific method that is grounded in our understanding of how human beings are narrative creatures who engage in goal-directed behavior, and in this case, solving problems. Mm -hmm. That is what the scientific method is an expression of these very basic human principles in human cognition. Mm. So this is what we're moving towards, a model or a system where the documentation of the science that we engage in is about specifically about the science that we've done. It mm. is governed by the science that we're doing, not by the constraints of a publishing industry. Does that mean that we completely do away with the paper? 
Actually, no. The paper assumes a satellite that we call the narrative. And what do we mean by the narrative? It means that it is, it becomes in essence, an extended abstract, which is what most papers are now anyway. Mm -hmm. What it means is it describes in very general terms what was done. Mm -hmm. And it contains pointers to all of the satellites where all of the real meat can be found. True. So yeah, documentation will explode. It will. But then that means that we actually have usable and reliable scientific processes. I mean, documentation. The good thing is, we're already some some institutions and organizations and services and tools are already. Um, That's that working. was the next point. Thank you, Joe. We, this is why okay. I say that we're moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. So I've been attacked and told, "Well, we don't really need this model." To which I say. This model is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Mm -hmm. This is already happening. This mm -hmm. model is to help you understand what is happening. I'm yeah. not telling you to do it. I'm telling you it's happening, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. So that's to every single director of every research institute and every university who says, we don't need your model. I'm not telling you, you need my model. I'm telling you, if you want to understand what's happening under your nose, the model will help you understand. Mm -hmm. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like when I say we already have tools, like what's it called? Um, protocols.io is mm -hmm. commercialized now, but it's actually useful in kind of kind of collecting and providing uh standardized protocols. Or yeah. anyone mm -hmm. can actually upload a protocol and then other people can compare what they're doing. So there's a certain level of standardization. Standardization, I think, also makes sense to yes, to streamline and to mm -hmm. kind of be, be, for us as a community being able to assess quality and to make workflows more efficient. But then standards can only apply to a certain context, is what I would argue. Um, and it's necessary like anything to contextualize a standard and then also to not assume this applies now to everyone on this planet and all research communities and all research disciplines but to contextualize where was this established who was involved in setting the standard in the mm -hmm. first place and mm -hmm. who was excluded who is this mm -hmm. not necessarily for by default mm -hmm. and who mm -hmm. else do we need to recruit to assess the standard or to mm -hmm provide that the, to deviate or what's the word like to to design adopt to the standards to and now work better yeah. yeah 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 no absolutely absolutely yeah but um speaking about uh protocols io um the protocols that they produce um become sub satellites of the methods satellite mm -hmm. so one yeah. of the really powerful things that helio does is open science has been very very good at creating so much infrastructure. And one of the problems that it has because of this is that many people think that doing open science means using these tools. And that's actually completely wrong. Doing open science is about making your science transparent to others, documenting it well enough so that I don't know, 20 years after your death, people can still use the science that you did. And oh. all of these tools are intended specifically for that purpose. Oh. So it's not about using the tools. It's about using the tools to make your science transparent so that others can use it. Oh. That's the part that gets lost. So in one of the, in my poster, um, I have a diagram. It's a classic diagram where you have um, open science at the center, and then you have a whole bunch of spokes going around in a circle, and then you have other little circles attached to these spokes, and there you have, um, I don't know, open access and open, open what? Open tools and open software and open whatever, and it's all about open science at the center, and mm -hmm. that is not exactly right. Instead, instead of putting open science in the center, we should put methods in the center, or we should put analysis in the center, because all of these tools are ultimately about serving the different steps in scientific processes. Also, That's what wouldn't, they're about. I wouldn't say open science as the center of things, but the overarching kind of theme. And then- No, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I want to get away from 
our the so so you and I are on the same page. We understand what open science is trying to accomplish. The issue is that for people trying to understand and practice open science, they somehow get stuck in the idea that you're doing open science if you're using these tools. Mm. And that's not entirely accurate because open science isn't per se about using the tools. Mm. It's about using the tools to make your science transparent. Yeah. Which of course raises questions about whether you're actually, whether you're, if you're actually doing open science, if you're only applying transparency to one part of your scientific process. So if your analysis is completely transparent, but we don't really have a good understanding of where your data came from because your methods aren't clear, or we don't really understand what your argumentation is um, to support the hypothesis that you chose. Is this really open science? And I know that this is pissing me off some people who are listening to me right now. Mm. But I, to those people, I say, ask yourself the question, is this really open science if all you have is transparency in your statistical methods? But everything else is completely opaque. Well, then there's also the difficulty of how open is open enough. That's a different question. That is a different question. And I, I don't think there can be just one answer to that, but it needs to be again contextualized. Like how open can a certain research project be given sensitive data, given industry? That's a completely different question. But then being no, that is a completely of different of question. Okay. That is a completely different question. So what I say in response to that is that one thing that has been neglected within the open science movement is that there are actually two steps to open science. The first one is documenting what you did so that other people can understand it. Mm -hmm. The second step is making it available. And with the open access movement, what happened is that we made it available. We, we made the stuff available without really looking at the quality. We sure. got it backwards. Yeah. So yes, yeah. document it all. So that, I mean, even if you're just talking about yourself, being able to understand what you did mm -hmm. in two weeks, and then you can decide which parts of that you're going to make open. So but that's, first you have to document it first or, or record or whatever language you want to use. And yeah, we're not so, doing that. Yeah, I agree. And that comes back to a recurring theme on this podcast series, also the difference and the blurry line between openness and fairness, as in findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, mm -hmm. where you can also have just two or three of fair, not necessarily all four thereof. But mm -hmm. ideally, it would be all four. So as long as everything is fair, would you argue that it's also open science? Because... It's accessible. It does not necessarily have to be open to everyone and anyone who has internet access. Or is the access part as an openness to all details of the scientific journey? Uh, those are really, really different questions. What I'm talking about is making sure that there is a record somewhere yeah. of the work that you did. In that's enough the findable detail. and accessible part or findable part only, right? No, but findable is making sure that whatever you, it is you wrote down can it occurs in a database right. or is okay. someplace that it can be found. Right. So fair assumes that documentation has happened, which is often lacking. So we're basically making assumptions on open science and the whole conversation and movement. Exactly. That documentation is, is actually or happening anyways and probably being mandated yes. and demanded by institutional policies but not happening to the exactly so the, the problem is um to go back to, to the big issue is that um no one is really taught how to document for usability one mm -hmm. of my favorite sentences to hate mm -hmm. um is uh when people are told in textbooks or in mm -hmm. workshops or wherever to describe what they did so that somebody else can do it. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? What information should people write down? Yeah, I'm laughing because I have the same discussion 
in an entrepreneurial setting now with documenting the institutional processes, which is basically mm -hmm. the same as the research process, but just different sector. And so with, with a colleague of mine, um, I have exactly those conversations. I'm asking, can you please document this? So the institution has an opportunity to learn here and also for yourself to make sure not to miss a thing in the process um, as we collaborate. So that's, yeah, I mean, it's easy, easily said. So, so difficult, let's say, I don't think it's very difficult to do, but it's so difficult. Oh, to actually, it you're wrong. It's really 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 difficult to do i think it's but more it's of a habit change that's needed because we don't do that we don't learn like i said but then once we understood like the way i take notes for myself and my business is so that i can actually apply the action to it but then to teach others and how to take notes in such a way that themselves or others can then take action on on the notes as a whole okay so um I'm going to say that there are two points here that should not be confounded. The first one is that we do not teach to science in such a way that we consider documenting as we go to be part of the practice. Most researchers by far consider documentation as separate from doing the science, mm. as something they do afterwards. Usually, and they think usually that the sufficient documentation is the paper that they write. This is most researchers by far, unfortunately. Well, so hold on a second. Hmm. Hence, what we need is to change the practice so that researchers understand that if their science is not documented, it doesn't matter how brilliant it is, it does not exist. Mm -hmm. You must document as you go. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is that early scientists knew this was true. This is why we have notebooks. This is why we have so much documentation and can reproduce so many of the early experiments because we have the documentation. So mm -hmm. that's the first part, okay? Mm -hmm. The other part, which is the part that really, really kills me, is that we actually have a massive science, a massive discipline on problem solving in science and technology. So if you do a search right now on Google Scholar, you will get over 5 million hits on studies about how researchers, engineers, and other STEM workers solve problems. Mm -hmm. The problem is that that literature pretty much amounts to forehead rubbing. Sit around and you rub your forehead because it feels really good. What does that mean? That that work is an academic exercise. Virtually none of it has been applied to teach scientists how to document how they solved their problems. And this is the work that my team and I have started to do now, to uh -huh. use our understanding of how we solve problems to document how we solve problems, because this is what science is. It's problem solving. And if we want good, reliable records of the science that we did, we need to understand how to document how we solve those problems. That's, I mean, that's pretty much the documentation that yeah. that is scientific documentation. The many problems involved, the, ma the many problems that we solve as part of conducting a scientific process. But I mean, we, we, we understand how we solve problems. We just need to just, we mm -hmm. need to figure out how to use that knowledge to teach how to document how we solve that problem. And we actually have a whole bunch of other knowledge from human cognition about how to do it. Yeah. Where we're at is that we need to put it all together and apply it. And that is hard. I agree. I I want to just um, you know, go back to two things you said. First of all, I would argue that the whole doc necess necessity for documentation, the system knows in certain disciplines. Where I'm coming from, in biology, where asked and yes. tasked and handed out a lab notebook and paper where you might argue oh that's old school but it's actually good to use your hand and write a document for, like manually for mm -hmm. the brain to actually capture what's happening and to reflect and everything so cognition mm -hmm. research would um, testify to that but so i so the system knows this it's just that the the rush for publishing the, the good publication pressure i had mm -hmm. right. adds yep. pressure yep. for this like key step to be uh, neglected or just and also sometimes just of laziness so sometimes it's like for me I can like now openly say like for me I thought oh, I'll do that tomorrow and I never end up doing it 
this is why we need to learn to do it in step with the science we do yeah yeah so i do like like theoretically and also mandatory the the the, like it's it's in the system is not being done to again a necessary extent the other thing you said so can we like how can we reinforce that but i i would argue that we need to sensitize people like early career researchers or any career stage really like that unless you publish and you have everything in order you have like done your work properly even in, after like in retrospect like you said, the, the paper is worth nothing because nobody can use it and apply and whatnot. What not. Like it's just it's a very expensive nothing at that. Yeah. It's, it's a little... very, very expensive nothing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, so that's uh, that's that's the problem. We have a scientific record at the moment that is mostly useless. Because impressive, in order to really highly useless, you know. Yeah. Um, the so, other thing I, I can't remember now because it's just too thought boggling what where the conversation is going. But also, I mean, it's also, I mean, we sort of know this, but it's, it's good to put actual words and, and have a conversation around this and hopefully also encourage others to have similar conversations in, in their context. Um, so what's next? As Okay. Um, we, you and I, we also agree that we'll explore possibilities to take um, next steps as in there's likely webinars coming up on these topics and other formats to disseminate your heliocentric open science model further to um, further go into examples and guidances of some of the, the topics that, that you touched upon. And we discussed um, just scratching on the surface a little bit um, challenging the status quo but also like pragmatic things like how to read a research article i already have in my portfolio course on strategic reading which is probably just a again a fraction of what you can then further enlighten people on how how to investigate um, what's documented in a research article and how, how then to approach that and to make use of the information mm -hmm. so there's likely in well certainly in our access to perspectives context more of you to come and then besides that what's your next steps um moving forward with okay so as i mentioned we we're continuing to do experiments on science reading mm -hmm. um we need to figure out faster methods faster pedagogical methods um to teach people to understand the narrativity inherent in papers so we have training seminars and they take several hours. And then ideally um, they need a lot of practice. I mean, learners need practice to do this. There is no way around that. Um, and one of the ways that we are trying to get this to happen is by developing another paradigm that we call literature content management, which is where we're teaching people to develop their own personal database of the key information in papers. Mm -hmm. So the methodology that we're using has been derived from Prisma, which is um, a, a tool that was developed specifically for systematic reviews. Um, but the idea is that you read a paper and you need some version of guidelines to understand what the key information is within mm -hmm. the context of science being a narrative. And once you identify these key points, you need to reframe them in your own words because this, this increases um, uh, recall and comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, so we're using what we know of how the human mind works um, as much as possible. So you reframe these key points and then you put them in a database. So what you end up with once you've read say 20 papers is your small database of all of these papers that you've read with all of this key information that you can you can search through. And you can compare this paper with that paper, the key points in these papers. So that's one methodology that we're still uh, continuing to develop. We've just done the first two, three workshops. They need lots of refining. Um, it takes a long time to teach people to do this. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other side of this is that within Helio, one of the things that it makes abundantly obvious is that there are two types of participants for the scientific record. 
there are users of scientific information. Mm -hmm. And this is who we address with science reading and with literature content management. But then there are producers. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that we're working on, which is to develop the methods, once again, with the assumption that science is a human product. It's the product of human cognition. And therefore, it needs to be documented using those constraints so that other humans can understand them, understand the science. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, beside the point that you want to make this machine readable or that you want an AI to process it. The bottom line is that it will always be a human being producing the science and a human being understanding the science. Mm -hmm. So therefore, those constraints need to be respected. So we're developing methods to document the science so that another human mind can understand it 20 years after your death. That is our, mm -hmm. our fairy tale goal. We're not there yet. We're still working <laughs> on it. It's the hardest work we've ever done, yeah. um, but it's still worth doing. Totally. Yeah. I mean, talking about research integrity it is basically connecting the dots and providing the tools for researchers yeah. to make it easier for them to actually conceptualize on why we here yeah. to do what we do. Yeah. And, and these tools are not computational tools. They're not more infrastructure. It's they're cognitive tools. Yeah. They're pedagogical tools. Yeah. Which these funding it. organizations do not want to pay for. They want to pay for yet one more little program. And it's like, they will we have up. a lot of that. People uh, aren't using it. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm sure there's funders out there who would appreciate. I just need to find them or they find us. But I, I agree, like the tech hype in our in our what is it, in our era, or especially now also with AI and everything. Like it's just Oh, I'm so and, sick of it. It's it's people have like forgotten. The whole people put into machines is ridiculous. Instead of mm -hmm. like can we just keep using our brains or start using them again? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like it's, it's it's all of these toys to help people avoid using their brain and they keep forgetting the old what is it edict from the 60s and 70s garbage in garbage out if what you're putting into these systems is garbage what you're going to get out of them is going to be garbage mm -hmm. so i mean you can put all of the papers that you want into an ai but if you consider that the papers are inconsistent and incomplete and virtually unusable by human minds. I don't care how you slice them and dice them and parse them. Yeah. I mean, what the hope I would get from the narrative in a research article is so there is a certain amount of cogn cognitive effort by the authors, but it lacks the connection to the actual data mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. and the transparency thereof. All right. Yeah, um, I mean, also, I mean, I, I also want to clarify that I am not saying that the science that we have done is crap. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the documentation about the science that we've done is crap. It's crap or not enough. Because some people have accused me of saying that the science that we do is crap. That's a really, really different not point. Crap is pretty much. Useful. And if any, I'm it's, sorry, what? It's not crap necessarily, but it's useless to a large extent, which again boils down to crap, depending on the documentation for it is crap. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it, that that's different. So one of the things that we can do with the narrative methodology that we develop is try to salvage as much as we can, so that we can avoid throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's what we're trying to do. How much can we actually salvage, so that we can make better educated guesses when we try to use the science? Exactly. With that's, all that's... that, um, pointing to the deficiencies in the research ecosystem, what are what is an advice you would give an early career researcher listening to us now? Also to basically motivate and encourage them to pursue their career or and what to look out for. Oh my God, there's just there's so much. I mean, the first thing that I do tell early career researchers is to remind them that they're public servants. Their job is to create knowledge for the human species as an endowment. That is your job. Hmm. And I, I think that that idea has somehow been lost. It's all become about advancing in your career. And I understand we all have to eat. Hmm. But 
our job is literally that. We are public servants. Act like it. That and also, I mean, where some glory comes in that might be diminished by the by the thought of being a servant is that we also entrust it with yes. faith in our skills and the career we're pursuing to generate that knowledge for society. So there is yeah. accountability, accountability, also a certain status of trust. And yeah, and with that comes accountability, which then demands documentation. So the circle is closed. <laughs> but precisely, precisely. Uh -huh. And then we, we wonder why we have a situation where so many people don't trust science. And it's like, well, there are several issues there. Generalized scientific illiteracy is a problem. I mean, we just ran a poll on, on, on Mastodon and on Twitter. Close to 40%, 40% of our respondents. Now, granted, this was only about 300 people, um, but most of these people are researchers, said they had never been taught the scientific method. Mm -hmm. I mean, how catastrophic, it, it just, it doesn't fit in my head. How mm. did we get there? We're not teaching the basics of what science is. Yeah. It's so like that's one part of it. Amongst yeah. the first couple of sentences, is, is assume that it's just being picked up through osmosis at some point. No, but, but it's not. I mean, we need to teach these things. And then that uh, combined with the mythos around being a scientist, that to be a researcher, you have to be superhuman and super intelligent and just, you know, stand above all humans. That mm. is such bullshit. Scientists are just human beings and right. they solve problems and they address questions in the same way as any other human being. Yes, with more knowledge and with more experience in addressing these kinds of questions. But the general methodology is the same as someone figuring out a good recipe. It's, mm. I mean, it's, it's a human process. By setting ourselves apart, mm. we've put ourselves up on, on a pedestal. And that means that the, the higher we get on the pedestal, that is the, the, I mean, the farther we have to fall. And we have fallen because we can't keep up this myth that everything that we do is objective and perfect. It's not. We're human. We can't create perfection sure. and objectivity. I so like it's to, our fault. Yeah. I like to end on a positive note, though. Oh, okay. All of <laughs> that. That's hard. <laughs> I, I hear Me you. And I agree. Yeah. Um, so we are on the, like, in the middle of the journey, whatever we consider as middle. The middle might also mm -hmm. be long. But as <laughs> through time and space. Um, and there is progress to be made. Also, as a, an evolutionary biologist, like evolution and nature can be messy, but it's also beautiful. So mm -hmm. um, let's embrace the process. And thanks so much for sharing your wisdom with us. And it's really enlightening. And I had a lot of A to P access to perspectives moments in this conversation again. <laughs> Looking forward to Thank many so more. Much. Thanks, yeah. Monica. Thank you so much, Joe. Okay. Bye. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management, and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.